Buried within these delicate documents lies an incredible story of courage and fortitude. A history hidden for nearly 200 years, discovered among the archives of the St. Louis Civil Courts building. These legal papers give us an amazing insight into St. Louis's lifestyle decades before the Civil War, when keeping slaves was customary. While many of us believe a slave's only path to freedom was to run away or be granted freedom by their owner, these documents tell us something different. Hundreds of brave black men and women defied their owners and put their faith and fates in the law of the land, taking their owners to court. They were seeking freedom. In the late 1990s, workers from the St. Louis Circuit Court and Missouri State Archives made an amazing discovery in the Civil Courts building in downtown St. Louis. Buried among hundreds of boxes were papers yellow with age and still covered in coal dust from two centuries ago. While they didn't look like much on the outside, these documents reveal a history lesson beyond any historian's wildest imagination a written account of what life was like for a slave in St. Louis. These court cases describe fears of being beaten or literally sold down the river to a harsher life, tells of families torn apart but still determined to be free. In 1807, nearly 40 years before Dred Scott filed his suit, a Missouri statute was put in place making it legal for a person held in wrongful servitude to sue for their freedom. Historians have come to call them freedom suits. My story begins when my mother Polly was captured into slavery. It was a dismal night in the month of September. Polly, with four other colored persons, were kidnapped. After being securely bound and gagged, were put into a skiff and carried across the Mississippi River to the city of St. Louis. The Negroes were brought out and placed in a line so that the buyers could examine their good points at leisure. Major Barry was immediately attracted by the bright and alert appearance of Polly and at once negotiated with the trader, paid the price agreed upon, and started for home to present his wife with this flush and blood commodity which money could so easily procure in our vaunted land of freedom. After that, my mother registered a solemn vow that her children should not continue in slavery all their lives and that we must get our freedom whenever the chance offered. Seeking freedom. It is inconceivable for us to imagine life without the liberties we enjoy every day. Yet, very early in our nation's history was a time when human beings like you and me were denied their freedom, their chance to live their lives as they wanted. Instead, they were property, a commodity, traded like video games that could be passed from one person to another. This is the largest single collection, and better yet, uh, we've put them all online. So they're now available for uh, research all across the country. But one of the, the, the key things is this will help rewrite not only St. Louis history and Missouri history, but parts of the U.S. history by the time we're done. We will understand uh, this aspect of slavery far better than we've ever known. What is so unusual about these cases is that many people thought they were lost or didn't know they'd be able to get access to them when suddenly this archive became available. And many of the cases are very revealing. But what has us so excited is the fact that these are new cases that we hadn't looked at before. The thing that strikes everybody first is to just look and see where it says Polly, her mark and she, all she's been able to do is make an X. At the time when the declaration mentioned, the said plaintiff was not the slave of said Phoebe, as she is above in her plea alleged. 
Mother was especially restless because she was a free woman up to the time of her being kidnapped. So the injustice and weight of slavery bore more heavily upon her than upon me. Following an argument with her mistress, the master took my mother to an auction room on Main Street and sold her to the highest bidder for a $550. Oh, God. The pity of it. In the home of the brave, in the land of the free, in the sight of the stars and stripes, that symbol of freedom sold away from her child to satisfy the anger of a peevish mistress. By the mid-19th century, slaves desiring freedom faced a monumental task. They had four options. The stronger fit slaves often chose to run. Another option involved manumission, or obtaining papers of freedom from the owner. A slave could also try and purchase their freedom, but this was open only for those slaves who were allowed to earn money, or they could sue their owner for their freedom. The place to begin with the quest for freedom is uh, 1769, when a Spanish governor decreed that no Indians be held in slavery in the territory. And as a result of uh, this decree, uh, many people of Indian ancestry who were held in slavery brought forward their claims to freedom. I'm Marie Jean Scipion. Uh, her family sues based on the Indian heritage of Marie Jean Scipion's grandmother. And it was through that case that Indian slavery came to be outlawed in this state of Missouri. The right of a slave to sue was written right into law. I mean, there, were, there I mean, it was addressed directly that the slaves had a right to sue for their freedom. Uh, and secondly, the slaves were not declared formally non-citizens until the Dred Scott case reached the U.S. court, the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court in the 1850s. There is a law written by the legis by the by the assembly, the territorial assembly, that says you can sue for your freedom and you can sue for your freedom as a poor person which means that you don't have to put up a bond, which means that an attorney shall be appointed for you, rather like our pro bono or public defender sort of attorneys in our system. Um, and that law continues in one form or another up through the Civil War. However, at various points it changes. One of those changes came in 1825 when the Missouri Supreme Court set the precedent of once free, always free. The uh, most popular way of gaining freedom through litigation of, of a freedom suit in the courts, uh, in the circuit court in St. Louis, was through the doctrine once free, always free. That is to say, if a person had been free at any point in his or her life, at birth or by manumission later on in life, uh, or by residence, legal residence in a free territory, which is distinct from being a fugitive, in free territory. That is to say, having resided in a free, on free soil by virtue of the fact that one's owner had taken one there, the enslaved person became free. Well, the case of Winnie versus Whitesides established the Missouri precedent that slaves who had been transported and resided in a free territory were thereby free. So the once a free person, always a free person doctrine came from this Missouri case. Now, Winnie claimed that because she had been transported by her masters from North Carolina through Illinois, a free state, to Missouri, she was thereby a free person by virtue of her residence for a time in Illinois. So what she did was she sued as a pauper, meaning sued as a poor person. So she was given a state council to take her case. And she was ultimately successful based on the sequence of residence rationale. Many people moving west would find open land uh, in Illinois, for example, unclaimed or if claimed, not occupied, and would, would find themselves there at uh, planting time. People would set up camp, raise a cash crop for a year using the African-American labor they had brought with them sell it, raise the capital, and then move west. Yet, they're smart enough to know that this might qualify 
as residents in a free territory and therefore qualify their uh, free servant or their, their legally enslaved uh, servant uh, for the right to sue under one's free, always free. Many, many, many of the people who were purchased here had apparently been uh, hired out in Illinois, which if it's done for a certain period of time, the way the Missouri courts eventually ruled, uh, entitled someone to freedom because that was free territory, or had been brought through Illinois by someone who stayed in Illinois for a substantial period of time. Simply passing through a free state or free territory did not entitle one under the laws of the period to freedom, uh, but longer residence or being hired out there did. When slaves became free, their living children did not automatically become free. And so there are many cases in which former slaves would then have to sue their masters to secure the freedom of their children. Any children they had after they became free, however, would be born free. And I think that's the way to understand it. You're either born free or you're born enslaved. My mother returned to the house to get her few belongings and straining me to her breast begged me to be a good girl. She was going to run away and would buy me as soon as she could. When I heard that she had actually made her escape three weeks after, my heart gave an exalted throb and cried, God is good. In the daytime, she hid in caves and in the surrounding woods, and in the nighttime, guided by the wondrous North Star, that blessed lone stone of a slave people, my mother finally reached Chicago, where she was arrested by the Negro catchers. Fearing that Mr. Cox would wreck his vengeance upon me, my mother finally gave herself up to her captors and returned to St. Louis. Even in the early 1800s, St. Louis was an urban setting. Most slaves owned by families living in the city were not subjected to the daily back-breaking jobs of working fields and farms like their counterparts in the far south or in rural Missouri. Most slaves around St. Louis did domestic jobs, ran errands, or even worked outside the home collecting a salary and bringing it back to their owners. Still, they were enslaved people, forbidden to live their own lives. They were not field hands as a rule. They were urban employees as a rule. They had contact across the river. They would frequently travel across the river on business either with their owners or not. So they were aware that there's that freedom is out there, that there's an avenue to freedom. The lure of freedom is always stronger in an urban setting because of the uh, model of free blacks at the same living there at the same time and the presence of sympathetic whites and in St. Louis the presence of a bar that is a group of lawyers who are opposed to slavery who are willing to take these cases. St. Louis's population really began to explode in the 1820s, mostly from migration as people moved from points farther east, mostly from the eastern seaboard. And so the number of native-born white U.S. citizens went up tremendously. So too did the number of slaves because many of these migrants brought slaves with them. After my mother's return, she decided to sue for her freedom and for that purpose employed a good lawyer. She had ample testimony to prove that she was kidnapped and it was so fully verified that the jury decided that she was a free woman. Because St. Louis was located in a border state that supported slavery, but also sat across the river from a free state, its population was diverse. You had black slaves, free blacks, indentured servants, both black and white, and abolitionists, all interacting and communicating. This made for quite an active grapevine for circulating information. So because of that, there was some exchange of ideas, and churches for slaves were a crucial locale for the exchange of information. So on a Sunday, a slave might attend church, and of course, whether he or she would be entitled to attend church would be at the mercy of the owner. But in St. Louis, it seems that there was some fluidity in that slaves could sometimes go to church at 
as they desired. And during either the service or after, there would be information that would be dispersed to the slaves about the recent successes and victories uh, with the freedom suits. Well, slaves knew that other slaves had sued for freedom and won. And so, th I mean, this is always a slave uh, holder's fear, uh, is the sense that, uh, that free blacks were a bad role model for enslaved blacks because they, they let them have hope that there could be another condition, another way of being. In St. Louis, you had uh, a good deal of freedom to be with and in and involved in a slave community. Uh, you had the ability to act more freely. Uh, slavery w weighed a little bit less heavily. Uh, there was a large free black community which gave good support, especially the churches uh, and religious people, gave good support to slaves. So um, that would help people have the strength uh, to pursue uh, cases because there were, there were sympathetic others who were going to help you. In the meanwhile, Miss Martha Berry had married Mr. Mitchell and taken me to live with her. My mother's lawyer had told her to caution me never to go out of the city if, at any time, the white people wanted me to go. I was not surprised to be ordered by Mr. Mitchell to pack up my clothes and get ready to go down the river, for I was to be sold that morning. Can I go see my mother first, I asked. No, he replied, not very gently. There is no time for that. You can see her when you come back. How I did hate him. To hear him talk as if I were going to take a pleasure trip when he knew that if he sold me south, I would never see my dear mother again. I ran lightly down the stairs out of the front door to the street, and with fleet foot I skimmed the road which led to my mother's door, and reaching it stood trembling in every limb with terror and fatigue. On the morning of the 8th of September, 1842, my mother sued Mr. D.D. D. Mitchell for the possession of her child, Lucy Ann Berry. My mother, accompanied by the sheriff, took me from my hiding place and conveyed me to the jail. Of the more than 300 freedom suits found, about two-thirds of the plaintiffs were women. One reason for that is freedom followed the mother. If she could win her freedom, then her children were also free. The stakes were high, and the process was not easy. Taking your owner to court could be a life-threatening decision. If the master found out, or jurors ruled against you, and your case was lost, it meant the possibility of having to go back to your owner, and most likely a life of misery or death. But while losing was worse, winning didn't even guarantee freedom you could face some pretty severe consequences. Probably the, 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 the worst consequences uh, were being sold. Um, that means that your family could be broken up, uh, you, you could be sold down river further south, or but that was often the punishment for slaves who were uh, not considered or con considered to be bad or unruly or, or discontent. So you face the separation from your, your family. Uh, you are challenging the person who has lots of control, uh, near absolute control over your behavior and your life. If your owner challenged this, you would be treated harshly, violently during the period of litigation. You might be sold into slavery before the case could get to court. St. Louis was a very, very busy slave market. Uh, although the relative size of the slave population in St. Louis was rather small, it was a very, very busy uh, trafficking point for the slave trade. The benefits of freedom certainly might justify the risk. The, the strange thing is that even if a slave gets the judgment of liberation, which just sounds so wonderful, they're starting all over again. And they led real lives and wanted to lead better real lives. and. Uh... I would expect hook back up with what family members they knew about and uh, you know get started trying to live the life that they uh, uh, would have just as a normal person anywhere. The practical difficulties of suing for freedom were not insubstantial. Uh, Lucy Delaney, for example, spent uh, almost a year and a half, 16, 17 months, in jail under terrible circumstances and conditions awaiting trial. And the reason she was in jail was 
not just to keep her from running away, because obviously she was hoping that she wouldn't have to, but to protect her from retribution by her owner. And sometimes they do provide more than the legalese to say I was uh, beaten or, you know, held underwater or whatever it was to, to, to force them into submission and then taken from their original county or their state and brought to Missouri or to St. Louis. So it gives you that kind of detail. The judge read the law to Mr. Mitchell, which stated that if Mr. Mitchell took me back to his house, he must give bond and security to the amount of $2,000. And furthermore, I should not be taken out of the state of Missouri until I had a chance to prove my freedom. Mr. Mitchell gave bond accordingly and then demanded that I should be put in jail because he retorted her mother or some of her crew might run her off just to make me pay the $2,000. I was put in a cell under lock and key and there remained for 17 long and dreary months. My only crime was seeking for that freedom which was my birthright. It was not uncommon for owners who were prominent St. Louisans to drag these suits out for months, sometimes years. We find names like Shoto, Papine, and Cabernet listed as the defendants in these cases. These St. Louis families had enough money to pay their attorneys to delay the cases because they didn't want to lose their property. While slaves could sue their masters, it was illegal for them to testify on their own behalf. Their fate was left in the hands of white witnesses, white attorneys, judges, and all white juries who most likely owned slaves themselves. After advice by competent persons, Mother went to Judge Edward Bates and begged him to plead the case. And after fully considering the proofs and learning that my mother was a poor woman, he consented to undertake the case and make his charges only sufficient to cover his expenses. There are two opportunities, two options for a slave that wants to petition for freedom in terms of advocacy. The first option is to frankly try and hire an attorney, to retain an attorney. This is obviously costly and would require financial wherewithal or at least the support of an abolitionist or some free blacks or someone that's willing to help you bring that case through a private attorney. The way, however, that most slaves were able to petition for their freedom was to sue as paupers. So by suing as poor people, as paupers, they were then provided with a you know, state counsel akin to our public defender system now, which is quite remarkable. So the fact that uh, the statute provided for the assignment of counsel is a significant factor that at least helped level the playing field. But in terms of evidentiary terms, the playing field was not at all level because the burden of proof lay with the petitioner and a slave could not testify in court. Indeed, uh, a slave could not, uh, even a free black could not testify in these cases. So you had to depend on white witnesses to bring forward evidence of your freedom. And one of the things, looking at the freedom suits and looking particularly at the attorneys involved, which is one of the things I've been doing, that is really striking is the extent to which many of the attorneys, even those who took the plaintiff's side, that is the freedom seekers side in freedom suits, were themselves owners of other people. Attorneys use this time to show off their legal skills in the courtroom and to speak out against illegal slavery so that legalized slavery, which many of these attorneys took part in, would not be threatened. They were the 19th century equivalent of ambulance chasers. They knew they couldn't ask very much from their clients. It was in some states a rather disreputable form of law to practice because you're undermining the slave system. And since lawyers almost always had to be white, you are representing African Americans against other whites, which seemed anything from crazy to downright treasonous. But there were lawyers who specialized in this. And what is very striking is that in Missouri, and in St. Louis in particular, these included some rather prominent lawyers. Now, these were not abolitionists in every case. These were not people who were committed to ending slavery, although in some cases they were. So you found lawyers who were slaveholders suing. Uh, you found lawyers who were um, hostile, to, hostile to slaves suing for slaves' freedom, uh, helping them anyway. 
uh, because that was the law and they respected the law. You found Edward Bates uh, helping set slaves suit. He believed with all of his heart that uh, slaves were property and he had owned slaves himself and he could not transcend, he had the hardest time coming to grips personally uh, years later when it came time to free the slaves. But here he is supporting the rights of slaves and suing on their behalf in court. On the seventh day of February 1844, the suit for my freedom began. A bright, sunny day, a day which the happy and carefree would drink in with a keen sense of enjoyment. But my heart was full of bitterness. I could see only gloom, which seemed to deepen and gather closer to me as I neared the courtroom. I could not see one gleam of brightness in my future as I was hurried on to hear my fate decided. After the evidence from both sides was all in, Mr. Mitchell's lawyer commenced to plead. For one hour he talked so bitterly against me and against my being in possession of my liberty that I was trembling as if with a cue. For I certainly thought everybody must believe him. Indeed, I almost believed the dreadful things he said myself. And as I listened, I closed my eyes with sickening dread, for I could just see myself floating down the river, and my heart throbs seemed to be the throbs of the mighty engine would propel me from my mother and freedom forever. What you see in the judges, in some cases, is a kind of balancing act. It's an effort to have it both ways to say, I am a man who believes in slavery, some of these judges own slaves, I suspect, uh, and at the same, same time saying, but I am a humane man. I am a Christian man. I am a Democrat. I am an American, whatever uh, they have to say. So I suspect that it makes it easier, in a sense, to live with themselves, to, to, to presume that it is compatible. I don't mean to, to underestimate the nature of the moral uh, struggle that must have gone on. Ultimately, this is a jury verdict as well. Twelve good men and true, which means twelve white men at this time, have to decide on the basis of the facts presented that this individual is free. So it's an uphill battle all along. And the fact that as many slaves uh, attained their freedom this way um, uh, is, a, uh, is, is remarkable. My lawyer, Judge Bates, arose, and his soulful elegance and earnest pleading made such an impression on my sore heart, I listened with renewed hope. I felt the black storm clouds of doubt and despair were fading away, and that I was drifting into the safe harbor of the realms of truth. I felt as if everybody must believe him, for he clung to the truth. The majority of freedom suits were filed during 1824 to 1844, and it became a common way for slaves to obtain freedom. It was also common knowledge among pro-slavery supporters that a slave didn't need to have money to take their owner to court. The attitude of the court, and quite frankly the people of St. Louis, reflected an acceptance of the suits because they were filed under their current laws of the land. Petitioning for freedom, bringing a freedom suit, was a, was a bold move because it required the wherewithal in terms of stamina and commitment uh, and the lack of fear to pursue one's freedom. It would be easier to, frankly, abide by the status quo and you know, deal with one's family in that situation and sort of resolve to the, the bondage situation. But these slaves who were going to court to petition for their freedom were really taking great risks, not the least of which is putting faith in a legal system that itself has legalized the very institution from which they are seeking liberation. The court was also the chief administrative agency in St. Louis at this time. This is before there's a large city government. It's before there are county councils, uh, city councils, before there's a regular police force. And whenever there was a dispute, you went to court. For somebody to come in to a court, somebody who by conventional standards is relatively powerless and say, I am, uh, to declare that they have rights and that they are 
free, in their own minds at least, uh, is an act of enormous courage, but it's also an act of, of self-assertion that liberates others who can hear that cry. Whenever slaves sued for their freedom, that was a threat to the slave system. And slaveholders didn't want to see that happen. At the same time, part of the reason, I think, why there was a legal procedure for this was that slaveholders thought, what is the other option? If slaves don't sue for their freedom, how else will they secure their freedom? They'll secure it by running away or by joining a slave revolt. You can't undo those discussions once they've taken place. You can't take back those, those defining moments in trying to talk about what it means to be a human being, what it means to be free, what it means to be an American. On the morning of my return to court, I was utterly unable to help myself. I was so overcome with fright and emotion, with the alternating feelings of despair and hope, that I could not stand still long enough to dress myself. I trembled like an aspen leaf. At last the courthouse was reached and I had taken my seat in such a condition of helpless terror that I could not tell one person from another. Friends and foes were as one, and vainly did I try to distinguish them. My long confinement, burdened with harrowing anxiety, the sleepless night I had just spent, the unaccountable absence of my mother had brought me to an indescribable condition. I felt dazed, as if I was no longer myself. I seemed to be another person, an onlooker. In my heart dwelt a pity for the poor, lonely girl with downcast face, sitting on the bench apart from anyone else in that room. In the late 1840s, around the time the Dress Scott case was first filed in St. Louis, things worsened for slaves in Missouri. Slave owners felt under siege by increased pressure from free blacks and abolitionists. They were taunted by the liberties they perceived African Americans to have gained. So changes were made to bring things back under their control. Some slave privileges were revoked, the courts became more repressive, and handed down harsher rulings. Teaching slaves to read and write was outlawed. The pro-slavery militants effectively diminished the rights of black people. These changes, along with the state law passed in 1845, requiring slaves suing for their freedom to put up a bond to pay court costs if they lost, which many could not afford to do, drastically curtailed the number of freedom suits filed. During this time, Missouri Supreme Court also overturned its precedent, once free, always free, saying times had changed. Then, in 1857, the United States Supreme Court overturned the most notorious freedom suit, the Dred Scott case. The High Court ruled that people of African descent, whether free or not, did not have the rights of citizens which of course included the right to sue. These cases in Missouri are part and parcel of the rising sectional tension that eventually led to the Civil War. They're absolutely essential to that. Dred Scott is of course the most famous example of that, but that is merely part of a larger chain of lawsuits that raise tensions between free states and slave states. It's part of a, of a decade, beginning in the late 1830s, and accelerating into the 1840s, where uh, slavery was hardening. Anti-slavery was uh, getting louder, was getting more insistent, and a backlash of stricter, less compromising, more insistent championing of slavery begins to occur. By the time it reached the Supreme Court, the case of Dred Scott had been tried many times before, just not involving Dred Scott. There were very similar cases, numerous cases, where slaves claimed that they had been transported to free territories, had lived there for long periods of time, and that as a result of that, they were entitled to their freedom. And in some of those cases, slaves won. Uh, not in all of them, but in a large number of them. And what is striking is that whites acknowledge that as a fact of law. One of the results of the Supreme Court's decision in the Dred Scott case was to overturn that precedent and to say it no longer applied. These cases are a prelude to the Civil War. They are an example of how when 
legal avenues to change and social progress are cut off, which is what happened with the Dred Scott decision, then violence becomes the only route that oppressed people have. The verdict was called for and rendered. Mr. Mitchell's lawyer jumped up and exclaimed, Your Honor, my client demands that this girl be remanded to jail. He does not consider that the case has had a fair trial. Judge Bates was on his feet in a second and cried, For shame, it is not enough that this girl has been deprived of her liberty for a year and a half, that you must still pursue her after a fair and impartial trial before a jury in which it was clearly proven and decided that she had every right to freedom. I demand that she be set at liberty at once. I agree with Judge Bates, responded Judge Melanthe, and the girl may go. Oh, the overflowing thankfulness of my grateful heart at that moment. Who could picture it? None but the good God above. I could have kissed the feet of my deliverers, but I was too full to express my thanks. But with a voice trembling with tears, I tried to thank Judge Bates for all his kindness. I returned to the jail to bid them all goodbye and thank them for their good treatment of me while under their care. They rejoiced with me in my good fortune and wished me much success and happiness in years to come. These court cases changed lives and changed the course of our nation's history. There are decades of information buried in these long forgotten documents. It is impossible to know just how many lessons lay hidden in the brittle, dingy pages of these freedom suits. The United States was a country that was ruled by laws. Uh, and so when people struggled for freedom, they struggled according to rules. And these were the rules in which we all played under. And uh, slaves had rules that they could follow and, and try to, to seek their freedom. And so the documents represent they're trying to work within the system of American justice. They will prove tremendously illuminating on areas of social history because whenever a slave has to sue for his or her freedom, that slave makes a pleading that says, here was the state of affairs on the plantation where I lived or in the house where I was held in bondage. Here is my life. Here is how I was forced to move to another state or another territory. And these are in many ways small biographies about these people's lives. I think we can learn from reading these cases about the, the indelible spirit of people that are seeking freedom. I think the risks that these people took, that these slaves took, was huge. And I don't think we can fully comprehend what was at stake unless we've really put ourselves in their shoes. I think it's easy to read these decisions and say, oh, sure, that makes sense. If you can't escape and if you're not manumitted, sue for your freedom. But that's not an easy decision to make when your future and the future of your family rests in hands that have traditionally and historically been antagonistic. For the people who were involved in these freedom suits, imagine how it would look to them. We're talking now about all the legal manipulations and the system and this law and that law and how it compares with this. And the people that were involved in this, I mean, their basic, their summation of it would, would be, am I going to be free or not? What we hear in the bits of voice that come through in these cases, what we hear from Lucy Delaney, is, is a humanity that we understand because we share in it. What we hear are concerns about children and parents and siblings. What we hear is pride in one's own work, one's ability to support oneself and one's family. Exactly the same sort of things that at least internally uh, we say to ourselves to justify our lives and our ambitions. It seems to me that the first thing that these do is give us new insight into the issues of our own time and our own day, not just in something that we might have thought was resolved uh, with the Civil War, the Civil Rights Movement in the United States. The second thing I think they do is remind those people who are, for whatever reasons, whatever circumstances, marginalized, people who insisted on their own self-importance regardless of that 
huge social effort to keep them in their place, uh, to assert a higher, um, a higher nature for themselves, a higher place for themselves, if you will, not in some kind of social structure, but as a human being. Mother always made her home with me until the day of her death. She had lived to see the joyful time when her race was made free, their chains struck off, and their right to their own flesh and blood lawfully acknowledge. As this is a world of varied interests and many events, although we are each but atoms, it must be remembered that we assist in making the grand total of all history. Like pieces of pottery unearthed from an ancient civilization, these freedom suits offer an extraordinary glimpse into the lives of people from long ago. When we read the cases, we are transported back to a time of an imaginable hatred and a fledgling and misguided legal system. The cases also give us an opportunity to witness the hope, courage, and character of people bold enough to risk everything they had, including their lives, to march into court seeking freedom. If you would like to view this historical collection of documents, visit this website and read these heroic accounts that make up the largest known collection of freedom suits in the United States.